In the previous video, we explored the potential negative effects of sampling and what causes them. In this video, we will see a generalization of these concepts as well as a unifying theorem. In order to continue, I will present some basic concepts from Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis is related to analyzing the frequency content of signals and using that for further analysis. I don't want to get too into it, but I will present some basic principles that are necessary in order to understand the rest of what I'm going to say. The first principle is that of a frequency spectrum. The frequency spectrum basically shows us what frequencies are present in a signal as opposed to looking at its time domain representation. It's just another way of looking at a signal. Suppose, for example, that we have a signal, a sampled signal, x of n equals cosine of 0 0.8 pi n, a signal that we have seen before in the previous videos, and now we're going to plot this in the frequency domain, the normalized frequency domain in this case, and an axis of omega hat as opposed to an axis of time. Now the way that this looks, since it's at a single fixed frequency, 0.8 pi, the single fixed normalized radial frequency, it's going to just be a vertical bar at 0 0.8 pi, because that fully represents this entire signal. It's at a fixed frequency, and therefore it just exists at one location. But recall that this is also equal to cosine of negative 0 0.8 pi n, and therefore it also exists at negative 0 0.8 pi and furthermore we know that we have 2 pi periodicity in the normalized frequency domain so therefore this is also equal to cosine of 1.2 pi n so therefore there will also be a line at 1.2 pi and furthermore, at 2.8 pi n, which was by adding 2 pi to the original signal, this one was from adding 2 pi to the negative signal here, and so on, infinitely many such signals. So we have another one here at 2.8 pi, and so on. It doesn't end. So this one here came from this, and it'll keep going, and likewise in the other direction then this one came from negative 0.8 pi and it'll keep going and likewise in the other direction the whole thing becomes 2 pi periodic now when we talked about reconstructing a continuous time signal from the samples we talked about subtracting integer multiples of 2 pi until we reach the lowest possible frequency well that can be expressed very readily in this frequency domain because here the lowest possible period of 2 pi that we can look at is going to be between negative pi and pi. That is, whatever ends up between negative pi and pi is what we're going to use for reconstruction. And you can check the previous examples that we have explored in the other videos and you'll see that everything is consistent with this kind of a framework. If our original signal had a normalized frequency of 0.8 pi, that means that the sample rate was fast enough to capture all of its variations and all of these periodic copies end up outside of negative pi to pi and therefore are not the thing that are reconstructed. However, suppose that instead our original signal had created a normalized frequency of 1.2 pi n and so with our previous methods we saw we can subtract 2 pi from this and we get negative 0.8 pi n and which is the same as 0.8 pi n so we know that these two signals have the same exact samples. Well, expressing that in this normalized frequency domain, we see that the original signal starts off at 1.2 pi and likewise at negative 1.2 pi. And then due to the 2 pi periodicity, we see that this is also going to transfer to 0 0.8 pi and this one is also going to transfer to 
negative 0 0.8 pi, and so on. Again, it keeps going, but for reconstruction, we only care about what ends up in between negative pi and pi. And we can see that we get the same exact signal as before. So the reconstructed signal would again be cosine of 0.8 pi. We can do this as we did before, just by analyzing the sampled signal, or we can look at it in the frequency domain, in this normalized frequency domain. So this is the first principle from Fourier analysis that I have to present. And the second is what Fourier analysis says itself in general, and that is that any signal in time can be decomposed into an infinite summation of sinusoids. What this basically says is that given any arbitrary signal that's not just itself cosines or summations of cosines as we have been analyzing, but any arbitrary signal can be written as an infinite summation of cosines in one way or another. Now I'm not going to get into any of the details of how that's actually done or what it actually means, but that is something you should keep in mind. A way to illustrate this for any general x of n, not some fixed form with cosines or anything like that, is once again we can look at the normalized frequency domain and the way that the signal would look is for example it's going to look maybe triangular in nature and let me explain what this is as I said any signal can be broken down into an infinite summation of cosines that means we have infinitely many individual lines over here and they follow the outline of this triangle and the same thing in the negatives just like we saw before for every positive there's also a negative we have the symmetry about the y-axis in the frequency domain and so these are infinitely many cosines that break down a given signal. For some signals, this might be a finite number of cosines. For example, in the last example in the previous video, we saw a summation of two cosines. So it would be just made up of two lines. Now this general triangle shape, what it shows is that the signal has more low frequencies and then less and less of higher frequencies until a given cutoff at this point and let's call this point right here this will be important this will be the maximum omega hat sub m the maximum normalized frequency of this signal now remember this is the normalized frequency domain that means that everything is 2 pi periodic and everything is going to move just like it did before by integer multiples of 2 pi this entire shape is now going to move by integer multiples of 2 pi so this is here this is also at negative 2 pi and so on in all directions. So this goes here and further because of the periodicity. Now an important point to note here is this one over here and that is 2 pi minus omega hat sub m. Just like due to symmetry here this was at negative omega hat sub m so this is this point right here is at 2 pi minus that that's right here now we can see in this illustration the way that I have drawn it that this is greater than omega hat sub m so these two things are disjoint imagine however an alternative scenario where we start off with the same kind of a signal again this is omega hat sub m but now the copies here these th because of 2 pi periodicity end up overlapping so something like this this is still 2 pi basically what we're saying is that our omega hat sub m had started at a larger value than it had over here so let's say that over here this was let's say 0.2 pi and therefore this is 1.8 pi but here let's say that this started off at 1.8 pi and so therefore 2 pi minus 1.8 pi this is at 0.2 pi there is overlap so this point right here 2 pi minus omega hat sub m that still remains as is but here it is less than omega hat sub m and this is what causes all sorts of problems due to aliasing 
as we saw an example of in the previous video. But this is much more general. And from here we can actually derive a condition that must be satisfied in order to avoid this kind of a complication. What this shows us is that 2 pi minus omega hat sub m must be greater than omega hat sub m in order to avoid any problems. In other words, omega hat sub m must be less than pi, just rearranging this equation right here. Well, what is omega hat sub m in terms of things that we are more familiar with in the continuous time? Omega hat sub m is equal to 2 pi fm over fs. Whereas we normalized our previous maximum frequency in terms of hertz here instead of radial frequency by f sub s to create omega hat sub m. That's how it came about to begin with. So we can replace omega hat sub m with this expression and we get that 2 pi fm over fs must be less than pi. And this brings us to the final form of this, which is that f sub s must be greater than 2fm. And this right here is known as Shannon's sampling theorem. This is the general guideline of how to avoid problems due to aliasing. If the sample rate is greater than twice the maximum frequency of our signal, then we're not going to have any problems due to sampling or any problems due to aliasing, as it's called. And this is consistent with everything that we have seen before. For a signal that is a single cosine, our sample rate must just be uh, greater than twice its frequency because the frequency of the cosine is the maximum frequency of the entire signal. For a signal that is composed of a summation of cosines, the sample rate must be greater than twice the maximum component fre frequency of that summation. And for general signals, after performing a Fourier analysis, a Fourier decomposition, and getting to know what the gr greatest frequency in the entire signal is, we have to sample at least twice faster than that frequency in order to avoid aliasing. So overall, we have seen what physical properties dictate how often we must sample a given signal. We have derived Shannon's sampling theorem from intuition and have shown why it must be true.